Oops, sorry, there we go. So now that recording is in progress, I'll pose the question again. We had previously covered in the last class that if you have most, what you're dealing with is exclusively numerical data and you need to analyze that data, what is the best commercial pre-built application that's best suited for analysis of numerical data? Excel. Excel is correct, a spreadsheet. Now there are other spreadsheets besides Excel and there are free ones. Like if you use Google apps, you'll find that there is one that's provided. If you buy Mac computers that include um, the suite of apps, uh, they have one called numbers, right? And it's a spreadsheet. So it's the spreadsheet or Excel, Microsoft Excel is the primary example. I wanted to talk to you about how other scenarios key to the database, the use of a database. So we're going to zip down here. I wanted to make sure that we spent some time explaining that piece of it. So you remember we were doing some things in Excel in the last section, but there are other cases where multiple sets of data types are required. Now, when I say multiple types of data, I'm talking about currency, date, text, whole numbers or integers, numbers with decimals like floating point or real numbers, Boolean values like yes or no, true or false, male or female, and so on, right? So you have different data types that require uh, a different tool. If you're dealing with numbers, hey, that's great for Excel. But what happens if you have a case where you need to type, you need to track data sets and the data sets are related? And, and this is key. I'm gonna repeat that statement again. What happens if you're working in a scenario where you have to use technology and you have data sets that you want to be able to work with, and those data sets are related in some form or fashion. Uh, let me do this. And we have someone who joined us, and I just wanna make sure I get their name in there, or maybe they dropped and rejoined, okay. It was me, Professor Kandorf, I could join back on my computer. Okay, all right. Can everybody see this screen here? Yeah, I can see it. This diagram here. It's on the bottom of page five for your study guide. Now, what I'm showing you is a basic whiteboard drawing of two data sets. We call them data tables, okay? And You'll recall from our last session that I had this thing about naming variables properly. Well, when you get into a database scenario, right, and you'll you'll understand why this is this is an ideal case for a database, you're going to have database objects. And I like using the same conventions that you would for variables that you do for database objects. The most basic of all database objects is the data set or data table. And when I'm naming a data table, I like to give it a name that reflects its purpose. And I like to use a letter, a lowercase letter, so that I know, okay, what kind of database element or what kind of database object am I working with? And if you see a lowercase t, that means table. And does everybody know what the term orca means? No, that's the first time I'm hearing it. Sir. Do we have any marine biologists? Like, so it's like so oh, the killer whale. The killer whale, yes. Oh, I thought it was a computer science term. Fox. <laughs> yes. So Orca, all right. So in all fairness, there have been a number of students that have offered suggestions about what that means. And you're correct. There's a lot of other contexts where the word orca is used. But in this case, I'm talking about, let's pretend that we're all marine biologists, okay? And we're working a very high profile funded project to save the killer whales, right? Okay, so this is really important. And, and 
we are working with a population of killer whales. So we have to track data that for each killer whale. Put another way, one of our data sets is a listing of different killer whales by name. So it's like a tagging system. It's like a tagging system. That's right. It would be, so that data set would be ideal to set up a, a tagging system. So you could keep track of, okay, today we're, oh, look, there's Betsy. She just surfaced and she's, what is she chasing? Oh, she's eating a sea lion, right? So <laughs> in any case, killer whales have an interesting um, a set of life habits. But the point is, is that I have a data set and I'm calling it ORCA because to me that that's indelible. I used to work with a lot of marine species. So to me, naming orca is really specific. I'm not going to confuse bottlenose whales, narwhales, right whales, gray whales. When I say orca, I know I'm dealing with a killer whale. Now, each killer whale has a unique ID. So as I'm building my data table to track those killer whales, one of the things that I'm going to do is each entry in that table, each unique identity for each killer whale is going to have an ID number and it's a whole number and we would call that a an orca ID. Do you notice the camel case here? I used a capital O lowercase and then ID. So I'm doing the same kind of thing that I was doing for my variables. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay now my name. Now I could get fancy couldn't I? I could say, okay, um, I have the first name and the last name, if I had a first name and a last name for an orca, right? But let's just say that we're on a very familiar basis with the orcas that are running deep in the trench between St. Thomas and St. Croix, because I guarantee you with water at that depth and at that temperature, there may be some killer whales that are running those currents sometimes, okay? Now, let's say that I happen to have a whole fleet of marine vessels in our marine science department, and they're out there with binoculars and telescopes and, and, and uh, fancy tagging equipment with spears where it doesn't really hurt the whale, but it just sort of like hooks a little tag onto their fin where they can't feel it and so on. And they tag the killer whale on a certain date. And if they're around to catch the birth, to witness the birth, why can you witness the birth of a whale? Well, what's the first thing that happens when a baby comes out of a woman's womb? What's the very first activity everybody wants to hear that newborn baby perform? Uh, cry. Cry. Why? And why is that? Because that means that the gun goes out of the baby's lungs and that means the gun can breathe. It means there's breathing. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so what we're talking about here is a case where we know we can observe killer whale births because the mother killer whales have the same interest. These are mammals. They're air breathing animals. They have to get to the air. And a baby in particular doesn't have a lot of time. So the mother killer whale can't sit a half a mile down in cold water where it's air conditioned, even though that might be more comfortable. And I'm really extrapolating. And I know there are marine, a lot of marine biologists that are wincing right now because I'm saying that. But in any case, let's say that you can witness the birth date. You can tag. So you have a tag date, so you know why that you know when it's tagged with a sensor, a GPS sensor. The tag date is important, and the tag date is important for each identity of each orca, because first of all, if it's associated with their birth date and they're tagged when they're born, we can tell. All right, by extrapolation, how old is the whale, based on how old is the tag, and more importantly, the batteries in the tag don't last forever. So if we have a tag that's been out there for five years, mm, yeah, we might have a need where we have to tag again with a different tag because, well, when that battery dies, we lose the ability to track the orca anymore. The point is, is that I have a special set of data details and I decide which data elements are the most important for that data set. Now, if I did this with a spreadsheet, I'd have to enter this information every time I had a sighting. But let's talk about a sighting data set. Let's pretend that I have a population of two dozen killer whales. Oh, is that why it's called sting operation? Yeah, actually, 
It's a table for citing. So the the capital letter means citing. Oh, sorry, my dyslexia. No, that's okay. I completely understand. So this table is another data set. And I know that when I approach the scenario, I'm doing my study. I want to build a custom app. I want to be able to use the data I collect. I want to analyze. I want to be able to draw conclusions. I want to be able to share concerns and I want to qualify those concerns. I want to use data to support my recommendations. See, data-driven decisions are important. And if you want funding to protect the whales, you got to have data to show what's important to protect the whales. If so many are being killed every year, if they aren't being born as fast, you have to have data, data-driven decisions, right? So this speaks to the heart of our research. So I have a separate table. I have a separate data set that has to do with the sighting of those whales. Because if I have two dozen whales, well, they might be near the surface over here by St. John on Wednesday. And by Thursday morning, they could be halfway over to Tortola or to Antigua. Who knows where, right? The sighting table is a separate but related interest and it's vital. For the research that I'm doing, I need a second data set. And here's the key, and I use that term literally, here's the key I want you to see in this diagram. I have a separate table over here. Now, each of the fields that I track in my ORCA table, I have the ORCA ID, I have the name field, I have the birth date field or element, right? I have the tag date. Over here in the citing table, I have the citing ID. Now, what do I mean by that? If I'm tracking sightings, I want to keep my sightings separate. Put another way, every whale sighting is unique. Even if they're together, even if I get clusters or pods, they're called pods of killer whales. Sometimes I see killer whales by themselves. Sometimes I see them together. But when I sight, when I see each individual killer whale, I want to make sure that there's a separate sighting record. And if they coincide with each other, I know, hmm, those two whales, where were they? Where were the GPS locations? What was the date? Here's the ID, the sighting IDs. Oh, look, the ORCA IDs, right? True or false? I can have multiple sightings across a month for the same ORCA. True or false? Can I not have many sightings for one specific killer whale? Yeah. True. So if I use a spreadsheet to set all this up, I have a lot of redundant entries. Every time I'm trying to track the sightings, I have to repeat those things. If I want to have a clean representation of all the data that goes together, this spreadsheet kind of falls apart real quick as an ideal tool. But watch what happens if I build a second data table, a data set. If I include with the sighting ID, the ORCA ID, the ORCA ID, that ties back to or relates to, hello, there's a relationship with the ORCA ID in this table. Now, every ORCA ID here is unique. I only have one. Only one ORCA ID per individual, meaning that record is special and there's only one. It's a key field or key data element. Now, over on the citing table, if I can cite, if I can catch sightings of that same ORCA whale on multiple occasions, then I have multiple citing IDs for the what? For the same, for the same individual for the same orca id over time i can have an infinite number of sightings for the same orca i mean in theory if an orca lived to be very old and you saw them 17 times a month on average and you started tracking 27 years ago man you'd have a lot a lot of orca ids you'd use that orca id over and over and over again even though the sighting id would be unique the date and time would be unique the location would be unique the ORCA ID would be repeated every time that same whale came up for air. And why is this a great example? ORCAs have to breathe. They have to come up. You will see them all the time. 
if you have the means to detect them. Now, data tables can be related, hence the term relational database. Let's say that again. Data tables can be related, hence the term relational database. When you have more, two or more tables, you have a base of data tables and they're related. And oftentimes the trick is to identify where you have a case where there's a unique record that's used multiple times in another situation. We're looking for a match, exactly. And the key is sometimes we will have two tables where it's a one-to-one -one relationship, meaning there's a unique record here and a unique record there and they're related. But in this case, we know that we can have multiple sightings for the same ORCA ID. If ORCA ID one is Betsy, and I call this female killer whale Betsy, because she reminds me of an old, an old girlfriend that had um, quite a vicious uh, appetite and um, devoured a lot of very, well, all right, that's a long story. We're not gonna go there. Let's just say that I have affectionately called the first orca I'm working with, Betsy, for whatever reason. Uh, and let's say that uh, Betsy is going to be observed meticulously, intentionally. It's part of a study. I'm going to commit resource and time and energy. I'm going to commit funding because I'm going to put boats in the field, boats on the water, right? Whenever I cite that, I'm going to make sure I want to track that. I want to make sure that when it's the actual tag, that says, okay, here's Betsy, ORCA ID 0001. Put another way, this is like Adam and Eve, right? 0001. If I see Betsy 57 times in the month of August, and then I see Betsy twice after a hurricane, I'm gonna be able to analyze that data and I'm gonna know right off something is up with Betsy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? If I structure my data properly, and there's the key term, structuring my data. If I structure my data, if I organize my data, then I have all kinds of information. I have the name, that's uh, letters, right? I have the date. Well, those are numbers, but true or false, uh, a zip code is a number. True. True. True or false. I should use a zip code in a mathematical calculation. No. No. Yeah, that's correct. It's a reference point. A zip code is a unique identifier. But in that context, the number is really more like text instead of like whole number used for calculation. That's where the data type is important, which is why... When I'm naming my fields, I also want to include something about the data types. More on that later, okay? More on that later. The point I'm trying to make, and I want to beat to death here, is every time I see Betsy around, Betsy's going to be in a different GPS location. It's going to be a different sighting date. And I want to capture that information uniquely. But then later on, when I reference those things, I want it to tie back to the ID, the name, the tag date, the birth date, because... There are times I want to, oh, you know what? We have these three killer whales in the mix. How old are they? Well, I have three sighting IDs with the same GPS on the same date. Snap! They're together in a pod and they're, they're hunting as a team. They could be hunting a much larger whale, much larger prey. It could be a gray whale or a right whale, right? So I can start analyzing this data and I can start drawing what's going on. Is it mating season? And that's what, and they're fighting over a single female. I don't know. The point is, is that when I have this kind of information, I can tag it back to, or I can relate back to the names and identities and ages of those orcas. But if I don't have this set up, I can't tell anything. Right? So, when you have a scenario like this, where you have multiple data sets and it's a rich variety of data types, different kinds of data types, not just numbers, 
other information. Your commercial off the shelf application of choice is the relational database. And the primary example of that bad boy is Microsoft Access. Now, this is going to get interesting because for some stupid, and I'm just venting here, for some stupid, stupid reason, when you go to your My Campus portal and you download, you go to Office 365, did you know that you're entitled to load a free copy of Office onto your laptop? Um, yes, and, my, and Microsoft Word just goes to the IT and they um, help you download a student one, I think. Yes, that's true. So if I'm in here and uh, I, I go here, uh, it's going to ask me, if I'm a Mac user and I download the version of Office 365, for some stupid, stupid, stupid reason, the Mac version of Office 365 that you can download and install on your Mac does not include access. Well, we have a workaround. Actually, we have a great workaround. What you see here, this is a Mac. I am going to show, can everybody see my screen? Yes. In my office, yeah, we can see it. I have different hosts. I have different hosts that you can remotely access. We can set up access for you. And here you see a Mac that is set up so that it behaves and acts like the Macs I am asking some of our Mac owners to do. And I have the terminal right here so that I can test when we have assignments and activities in this class, I can test it and try it first. So if there's a difference, you know, if there's a difference between what you're doing for uh, the PG book virtual machine, and then here's a Mac user that's using the Mac instead. For those brave souls who are using their Macs instead, like it's a Linux machine on steroids, I want to be able to do this. But more to the point, I'm going to have virtual machines running on these Macs. And in a similar fashion, you'll be able to log into a Windows PC that runs Access. I'll set up a login and a password for you and you will connect in the same manner that I'm using here. I'm using Google Chrome. Google Chrome includes a feature called Google Chrome Remote Desktop. I can connect to Macs, I can connect to Linux machines, I can connect to Windows machines, and it's free. But it's also secure, so it works better than Teams Viewer or other remote desktop tools. So for those of you who are about to attempt to download Office 365 and install it on your Mac for the module assignments and solution that come next. I don't want you to fret or worry. We have a plan, okay? You're gonna show that you loaded Microsoft Office onto your Mac. Why? Because you're gonna do things with Olay. You're gonna do things with object linking and embedding using a spreadsheet to analyze data to display a graphical representation of the data where people can look at it, get quick, draw quick conclusions, and make informed decisions. That's the whole point of the computer application. Yes, uh, we have a question. Uh, well, does that include for people who have Windows or Dells like me? I mean, who have the going get uh, so the like so the question is, does that include? Um, students that have Dells and Windows machines. Yes, you're going to also download Office 365. The only difference is, is that when Mac users download Office 365, they'll get Excel, but they won't get access. We'll provide a separate remote screen to use for Mac users when we have our access assignments and solutions. Okay. So, uh, I wanted to spend the time to explain the whole business in the study guide. Because if you read this quickly, if you read this information quickly in the study guide, it may or may not occur to you how profound the difference between a spreadsheet and a database really is. And in which case do you want to use that information? Now, 
again, there's a key field that allows you to relate to another field in a separate data set or data table that allows you to create a base, a baseline of related data tables. And, and that's where some of that language comes from, okay? Now, I want you to understand if you see something like this in your in your study guide, do you think you're going to have some questions on this in your assessment? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So what I want you to be able to talk about the different commercial applications that are ideally suited given a basic different scenario. Okay. Now we've already talked about IPO tables, right? Pseudocode, I haven't talked a lot about pseudocode other than the fact that I've said that pseudocode is a way of writing out the logic of a custom uh, computing scenario. And we're not doing a whole lot with that. By the way, I do want you to know about GNU and how that means GNU is not Unix. And um, it has to do with open source software. One of the reasons that the textbook author's virtual machine is such a powerful thing is because everything the textbook author has provided to you, along with your textbook, it, it's, uh, if you were to do the same thing on a commercial level and provide someone with a Mac that does the same thing, you'd probably spend about $3,000. And uh, running it running a free computer system on a, in a virtual screen is actually pretty cool. So please, um, please keep your eyes peeled if there are references in the reading and I call out specific details from your textbook like I do here, right? I talk about chapter three. You, you may also find that in Blackboard, there is also a um, an addendum. Occasionally, I'll have an addendum. Let's check to see if we have an addendum. OK, I may post an addendum. It's additional information based on our classes and based on the textbook. So if you see module one study guide addendum, then uh, make sure that you review that before you attempt your assessment. Now, what I'd like to do at this point is ask if there are any questions about the information I just presented on a database, okay? What we just covered about how these tables can be stitched together, data sets can be stitched together. Now, there's other terminology that's commonly used, like you'll hear uh, if we have an ORCA ID field and a name field and a birth date and a tag date, you have a record. You, when you have entries with each of these fields, that related set of entries for Betsy is called a tuple or a record, right? When you have related records, that's often re a tuple or a tuple, depending on depending on the programming professor that you're working with. But in industry, when we're talking about database admins, the common terminology is these are called fields, right? And an entry of data elements for a given individual, that would be called a database record. So if I have a second ORCA, and this time it's uh, Dimitri, and let's say I have a second killer whale and it's a male and his name is Dimitri. When I fill out Dimitri's ORCA ID, a lot of times that'll be automatically generated as soon as I start entering the name Dimitri and the birth date and the tag date. A lot of databases will auto enter Dimitri as 0002. So Betsy is 0001. Dimitri's ORCA ID is unique and it's 0002. Right. Um, those are finer points of the database um, context. We'll talk more about that in our next um, in our next module. 
I just wanted to share with you a preview of coming attractions as we begin to review module two content on Tuesday. I'm going to post an assignment for module two along with the module one assessment. And the, the module two first assignment will be download Office 365 and install it on your personal system. Now, what do you do if you have a Raspberry Pi or uh, you have a Mac? Well, we'll set up the remote access like we talked about. Any questions about what we've covered in our database, our review of databases and what they're used for? And, uh, or any other questions? Does anybody have any questions before we get into support and assistance for the solutions? You had a question. Uh, my question is, we could just download, so for those of us that have the Windows and Dell, we could just download Office 360 ahead of time? Yes. And the second one for the question for the um, application. So basically this is more just like an organization with, um, where it's going to be like comparing the, app, um, the fields that are the most alike, in a sense? When we get into the database stuff, Yes, there will be activities where we're using the technology to perform comparisons and contrasts. Okay. So th the question was asked, are we going to be doing some comparisons with that software? And the short answer is yes. Um, part of the trick in using technology for scientific computing applications or any computing applications is to be able to identify patterns and when we say comparisons, we're talking about features and attributes and criteria that are the same. When some, when two, two or more things are compared with each other, technically speaking, the proper expression to describe that is to say, oh, we're looking at how those things are similar or the same. When we're talking about contrasting or, or identifying contrast, we're talking about the criteria's attributes between uh, individuals in a population or items in a set, right? We want to look at how they're different, how, how they're not the same. So a lot of times when people say, I'm going to compare and contrast this against that, the, a lot of times they're, they misuse those terms when you're talking about a comparison and contrast between two things. You're you're ana you're analyzing uh, your your data inputs to draw out how things are similar, but then you're also analyzing the data points to identify how things are different. So the contrast piece is how they differ. Comparison is how they're the same. Uh, but we'll do that later in the in the um, process. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll stop recording. And then if anybody needs to share a screen to get further along with their solution or any of the assignments, uh, that's what we plan to spend the rest of the class time doing. If you require none of that, you're free to clear the room. Uh, I hope everybody has a safe and pleasant Labor Day weekend.